This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hey, stand-up comedian and all-round good egg Tez Ilyas here. I want to tell you about my podcast, Tez Talks. It's a silly, smart, subversive stand-up series about being a Muslim in 21st century Britain. If you listen to my wisdom, you could one day hope to be more like me, Tez Ilyas. Subscribe to Test Talks from BBC Radio 4 on BBC Sounds. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast from BBC Radio 4. I'm Melvin Bragg, and this week's show is on Knock Knock Jokes. Ah, I had you there, didn't I? Uh, of course it's not. This is Comedy of the Week. Ah, oh, it's a good one too. Check it out. Hi, can I bother you for just a second? We're doing a radio programme, and I'm asking people to look at this map and telling me, can they spot something about this map? Is there something missing off that map? Whether you can see something that's different about this map. Anglesey's not there. Someone missing in there again. Anglesey. <laughs> so we're here somewhere, yes. or we should be. This is why we're making the programme. Anglesey's not there. Have you noticed that happening on maps before? Didn't you? Yeah, quite often. No, it's only small, like, right? but it's still there, isn't it? It should be there. Anglesey. 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 Anglesey! Anglesey! Oh, my oh, yeah. name! It's gone. How does that make you feel? Well, not very good. No. They haven't bothered, have they? No. They've blown the bridge up and blown Anglesey with it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tidir Owen, and I have a question. Where on earth is Anglesey? Now, that may sound a bit odd, given that I'm actually from Anglesey, uh, and if also I reveal that I'm in fact on Anglesey at the moment, even odder. As you will discover, I love this place, and that's why I'm worried about it. You see, I have in front of me a map. Here we are. Now then, let's have a look. Um, Yes, obviously I can see mainland Britain. I can see Ireland. I can even see a teasing little piece of France in the bottom here. But what I can't see anywhere is Anglesey. Now, this is a worrying trend that seems to be happening increasingly often. Did they forget? Did they simply not bother? Or is it something altogether more sinister? So join me in my quest to find out where on earth is Anglesey. Welcome to Anismorn, or as it's known in English, the island of Anglesey. It's the largest island in Wales, the seventh largest in the British Isles, and has a population of 70,000 people, all of whom are here right now. <laughs> you join us in the beautiful Anglesey town of Beaumaris, Beaumarie, which, as I'm sure you know, is French for ridiculously expensive houses. <laughs> Now, this will come as a shock to most of you here, but the uncomfortable truth is that not everyone knows where Anglesey is. I know, I know. If you look at a map of the British Isles, you will see that we are precariously placed on the top left-hand corner of Wales. I say precarious because if you look at some maps, we seem to have slid off (laughs) and aren't there at all. There was an explanatory map on the Robert Peston show recently that seemed to suggest that our beautiful island has either sunk or has rolled down the thin peninsula and pinballed its way through the Irish Sea. (laughs) And Mr Peston isn't the only one who's at it. Weetabix ran a competition on the back of their packets once which seemed to invite the whole of the UK to take part except Anglesey. (laughs) Do they think we're not worthy of their whole grain tasty goodness? The Isle of Man always seems to be on every map, doesn't it? Bold as brass, they don't even pay taxes. (laughs) And we all know what they do to their cats. How could this have happened? Anglesey used to be known as Morn Mam Cymru, which means the mother of Wales. Because of her fertile fields, she was effectively the breadbasket for the whole region. You know, granted, these days she's more likely to be seen wearing a dressing gown and slippers in Aldi's, but, you know, (laughs) she's still our mum and we love her. (laughs) So that's why 
I decided to make this programme, ladies and gentlemen. My mission is to reassure everyone that this island of Anglesey is going nowhere. By that I mean it's here to stay. <laughs> Why am I the person to take on this role of putting Anglesey back on the map? Well, I was born and bred here on Anglesey. I am a monwissin, as we say in Welsh, or as Prince William described us, Anglesonians. <laughs> Will and Kate apparently fell in love with Anglesey and a lot of that is down to the fact that us locals weren't really that impressed with this royal presence. And so they were pretty much left alone, weren't they? They were very well protected, of course, um, and the only obvious signs of the royal couple's presence here was the sudden appearance of some very beefy-looking bodyguards out and about. Oh, hello. I haven't seen you before. Morning. Uh, can I have some chewing gum and one of those uh, scratch cards, please? Is that a gun in your pocket, or are you pleased to see me? It's a gun. <laughs> oh. Oh, one pound ninety, please. These bodyguards were highly trained in fighting off would-be kidnappers and terrorists, but as they were used to operating in an urban environment, they soon realised that they had a weak spot when they were deployed to rural Anglesey. They were petrified of cows. It's true, apparently Special Forces unarmed combat training is useless on an irate heifer. <laughs> Has anybody any experience? Did anybody actually meet Will and Kate here? Yeah. Did you? Tesco Hollyhead. You met them in Tesco Hollyhead? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I believe you? <laughs> really? Did you, did you see both of them, or just one? Just Kate in the fruit and veg aisle. <laughs> I didn't expect to hear that at all, now. I thought he was going to say, like, an unveiling ceremony, you know, Tesco Hollyhead. <laughs> now then, I have an admission to make. I don't actually live on the island now. I crossed the bridge when I was 18. I, I know, well, I, well, to be fair, to be fair, I was lured by the attractions of the mainland, wasn't I? You know, the, the bright lights and the, the flush toilets, it was... Uh... <laughs> so, I suppose I do feel a little bit of a fraud, but that's how it's always been on Anglesey. People come and people go. Of course, we all have to get off the island from time to time for certain things like the hospital, don't we? Um, a mobile phone signal and... Uh... <laughs> and casual sex. Although... <laughs> And as some move off the island, others move onto it, introducing the natives to new, challenging ideas like atheism, salad, <laughs> and flip flops. <laughs> Anglesey has seen waves of immigration over the centuries. Our history reads like a chart rundown of invaders. So, like a good Anglesey B and B owner, let's talk about the pros and cons of all our visitors one by one. The Celts. Yes, indeed, it was the Celtic people who made their mark here first. Apparently, they migrated over the centuries from Eastern Europe originally. Imagine that. Just a free movement of people. <laughs> Just a free movement of people unhindered by borders and Angry audience members on question time. <laughs> the Celts were a tough, warlike people who slowly spread across the continent of Europe. They settled in places like northern Italy and France. But some of them obviously weren't content there. These were my ancestors. The discontented and disgruntled ones who would eventually become the Welsh and ultimately Anglesey people. This Italy place, this place is not the place for us. We need to go west. Oh, can't we stay here? The food's lovely and the weather's just perfect. No, it's far too pleasant. <laughs> it doesn't suit us. And I have seen the way you look at that waiter. <laughs> I have heard tell of a land that is made for us. We go on. We go West. 
Oh, for heaven's sake. Sorry, kids, we're moving again. No, I don't know if they'll have pizza. We'll find out. Come on. So they moved through what's now known as France. Oh, la, la, now then, this is nice. And there's some really decent wine for less than a fiver. Can we stay here? No, this is not the place. (laughs) And anyway, everyone walks on the wrong side of the bloody paths. We go onwards! Oh, for God's sake. And eventually, they reached Wales. (laughs) On a Tuesday afternoon in January, I like to think. Behold! This is our land. This is where we're meant to be. We were made for this place. The rain comes in sideways and it gets dark at half past three. (laughs) Oh, God, does it? I know exactly what that means. <laughs> the Romans! Then, in 61 AD, give or take a few weeks, the Roman legions came to North Wales. They were a bit cheesed off. They all came over with their suntans and tunics looking like Russell Crowe in Gladiator. One Welsh summer later, They looked like Russell Grant in Panto. (laughs) One Roman scribe wrote about the invasion of this island and described what the Romans faced on the opposite shores. It was like nothing they had ever seen before. A demonic-looking bunch with women flitting between their ranks in robes of deathly black, dishevelled hair and way too much makeup. And there was a circle of druids lifting their hands to heaven and showering curses and insults on the enemy. They were probably just speaking Welsh, but you know how paranoid some people get. (laughs) The invasion was led by Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, or Guy to his friends. I'm going to be your invasion leader today. So let's see what's so special about this island everyone keeps going on about. Are we all ready? Yes. Good. I didn't expect you to do that. Neither did I. And so, reassured by Gaius Suetonius Paulinus... And inciting each other never to flinch before a band of females and fanatics, the Romans charged and cut down all they met. Now remember, the most important thing is to have fun, (laughs) you brutes. So it seems the Roman conquest of Anglesey was swift and total. Never again would the likes of these fanatical men with their furious women folk be seen screaming on the shores of Anglesey? Well, not until the first Anglesey Young Farmers Club band dance in 1975, but... <laughs> the less said about that night, the better. The Vikings! Apparently, the Vikings realised they didn't have enough women folk to populate their new colony in Iceland, and so one day they raided and kidnapped loads of Anglesey women. It's true. The next day they brought them all back and didn't bother us again. (laughs) They learnt a valuable lesson. Don't mess with Anglesey women. (laughs) Then, in the year 1282, King Edward I landed on this very spot we now know as Beaumaris, which, as I'm sure you know, is actually the French for beautiful marsh, isn't it? They obviously had very inventive estate agents even then. (laughs) But the French king was very taken with this spot and immediately saw its potential. Oh, what a beautiful marsh. (laughs) Beau-Marie, I think I 
will build one of my castles here. It won't be very tall, but it will be perfectly formed. <laughs> and look very nice on postcards. <laughs> and also, I will build some beautiful houses. And they will be ridiculously expensive. <laughs> So that the only people who can afford them will be from the posher parts of Greater Manchester. <laughs> and also, on the seashore, I will build a disappointingly short pier. <laughs> and the posh people from Greater Manchester will walk to the end and say, You are! And I will say, oui. <laughs> and also, I will build no parking spaces. Pas de voiture dans mon bon mari. And in the summer months, it will be chaos. <laughs> Je suis très happy. <laughs> That's what he sounded like. English people, I'm sorry to break it to you like this, but you used to be French. Now then. <laughs> So that's the history of Anglesey. As you can see, we're quite a resilient bunch. And even after playing host to all these guests along the years, we've managed to retain most of our, our identity. We can be a bit disgruntled. Some of us still wear way too much makeup. <laughs> and of course, we still speak a form of the language which seemed to wind the Romans up so much. I'm at Llanfair Pwllgwyngyll Gogerachwyr and Drobwyll Santasiliog Ogogoch. This place has the longest place name in Europe. Now then, the sign at the train station is apparently the second most photographed place name in Britain. The first is actually in Dorset, as the residents of Scratchy Bottom know only too well. This village is a joke, or at least the name is. It's literally a joke. It was made up by a local businessman in the 1800s. It was contrived as a publicity stunt when the new railway line came to Anglesey. That's when you know your publicity stunt has worked, when people are still talking about it 200 years later. Anyway, this publicity stunt really seems to have worked, as this otherwise quite, let's face it, unremarkable village is now bustling with tourists having their photo taken in front of the famous sign and spending their travellers' checks, if that's still a thing, at this cavernous tourist shop next door. Curiously, and rather confusingly, for those on a whistle-stop tour of the British Isles, this is a branch of the Edinburgh Woollen Mills. I'm a bit concerned that tourists leave the village with a, a skewed view of UK geography and the false impression that we all wear kilts and eat an inordinate amount of shortbread. Well, I will admit to the shortbread, but this place is as Scottish as a suntan. Of course, locally, and for practical reasons, this place is still known as Llanfair PG. The PG meaning Puss Gwingill and not, as some suggest, parental guidance. Anyway, this place may be a joke, but if you can pronounce it, you have all the tools you need to say any word in the Welsh language. We're always asked, aren't we? Where are you from, from Anglesey? Oh, go on, say the name. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Come on, then, after three. One, two, three. Stand by the post Well done, give yourselves a clap. It's just occurred to me, I think we must have broken a record now or something. <laughs> now, you can't talk about Anglesey without mentioning the language. This island has always been a stronghold for the Welsh language because the majority of residents here are bilingual. But it's always been a place where many different languages have been spoken over the years. Uh, the name Anglesey itself is derived from the Old Norse language. It was Ongulsey or Ongul's Island. Not to be confused with the modern Ongul's Island, which is a kitchen unit from Ikea. <laughs> there... <laughs> there are Latin, Irish and French influences to be seen all over the island. But more recently, the English language has become quite popular, it seems. Now... I know this can be a thorny issue these days. As we welcome the latest wave of people moving on to the island, there seems to be a certain amount of suspicion surrounding the native language. Some even feel quite 
resentful towards Welsh. Um, my brother-in-law, um, Colin. <laughs> Let's keep this to ourselves now, right? <laughs> he is, unfortunately, one of these people. Um, my, this is a bit awkward for me, but my sister, she married this fellow from somewhere in England. I can't pronounce the name of the place. But, uh, <laughs> She moved him up to Anglesey 30 years ago. 30 years ago! Can't even say hello in Welsh. And as most of you know, hello in Welsh is hello. That's all it is. <laughs> it's not hard. Colin gets very paranoid when he finds himself on the island and hears me and others speaking Welsh because he's, he's one of these people who automatically thinks that I'm talking about him. Now, I don't know why he would think that. Um, you know, I might be speaking Welsh and I'll say something like... Um, let me see. Uh, oh, Sharad och chadig o Gymraeg a chonegi bloody Colin yn ganol y frawdeg. Well, <laughs> I'm being facetious because it doesn't need to be such a divisive issue. After all, being multilingual is a wonderful thing whichever languages you choose to speak. Did you know, this is interesting now, that the Welsh language was used by the Allies during the Second World War to relay messages from one part of the battlefield to the other, in the hope, of course, that none of the Germans had been on any camping holidays to Anglesey. <laughs> but they would find two Welsh speakers, give them radio sets, and get them to send secret messages to each other. Apparently, it was quite successful, up to a point. Ultimately, though, the only thing it managed to do was make the Germans really paranoid. <laughs> I'm intercepting a British signal. Oh, Daniel Boyne, shall I come back with a little? I'm on Friday here, they bloody Germans in Canada, Scotland. They are talking about us. I know they are. Whether they're talking about the wife, they're talking about Adolf Hitler. I tell you, they are talking about the Führer. I would encourage them to take a look at my mouth. The ball, but the Sassner out of the hall. Did you hear that? They are talking about our beloved Führer and his testicular situation. I'm sure they are. <laughs> But for the most part, we all get along quite well. In fact, Prince William was very keen on learning some Welsh during his stay on Anglesey. He was spotted in the market town of Llangevni one day with his then fiancée, Kate. Now, unlike my brother-in-law, Prince William was very eager to be able to pronounce our place names correctly. The story goes that they parked up in a car park and got one of the bodyguards to summon over a local to help them. They asked the young woman um, if she spoke Welsh, to which she replied she did, and then asked her to pronounce the name of where they were slowly and clearly so that they could get it right. And she obliged, pronouncing slowly and clearly, home bargains. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. It could have been Asda. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Anglesey is steeped in myths and legends, from the ancient Welsh sagas called the Mabinogion to our mysterious Neolithic burial chambers, and of course, the fabled farmer who voted to remain in the EU. <laughs> but it seems like every village and every field has a story to tell. Some of them, it's fair to say, which don't put us islanders in a very good light, because as with all good legends, there are heroes and there are some villains. As you know, Anglesey is on the edge of one of the busiest shipping lanes in Britain. And that's the way it's always been. For centuries, the Irish Sea has been like the M6 for ships. Although you'd probably still be quicker getting from north to south in a square-rigged clipper even today. <laughs> Hundreds of vessels have come to grief around the unforgiving coast of Anglesey. And some of them, I'm sorry to say, were not by accident. In the 18th century, there was a group of Anglesey residents known as Lladron Crigill, the wreckers of Crigill. They would stand on the rocks at night and wave lanterns and lamps to fool the passing ships into thinking they'd arrived safely at Hollyhead Harbour. Right? Unfortunately, they were in for a nasty surprise. Imagine, if you will, a stormy night off the coast of Anglesey where all is not quite what it seems. Aha! Lights on the horizon! Bozan! 
It seems you've reached port sooner than I'd reckoned. They don't look like arbor lights to me, Captain. Nonsense. Turn to starboard and prepare to dock. I'm not sure about that, Captain, sir. I hear tell of strange happenings in these parts, Captain, sir. Bad happenings, they be. Oh, no, don't start. Now turn towards the harbour lights, man. And why are you speaking that ridiculous accent? You come from Harrow. I always speak like this when something bad's going to happen, Captain, sir. Those harbour lights ain't what they seem. There be an old rhyme about these parts. When dark has fallen on old Angle Sea and lights on yonder shore you see. Remember this afore you're docked. Yes? Remember what? Can't remember the last line, Captain, sir. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, turn to starboard, man! And the ships would turn for the shore, only to find that indeed the lights weren't all what they seemed to be. But by then, of course, it was too late. <laughs> It's just rocks! It was a trap! We're done for, Bosun! I remember now, Captain, sir! What? Remember what? The last line of the rhyme! Remember this afore you're docked? If they be wreckers, you're probably... Oh, God save the abandoned ship, man! Save yourself! Apparently these wreckers weren't your usual band of renegades and outlaws because by day they were respectable members of society. It's sad that there were tailors, farmers, housewives, and even some chapel-going Methodists who would lure the ships onto the rocks. It's quite possible that some of the descendants are here right now. <laughs> Thankfully, these days, the only light sign to lure you in that secluded part of the island will be from a packed-up Vauxhall Zafira. <laughs> Still worth avoiding, as you'd end up among some very unsavoury characters and witnessing some equally unspeakable acts. Bosun? Is that you? <laughs> oh, that tickles. <laughs> so I think you'll agree that this island of Anglesey is much more than just a flat disk of land in the middle of the Irish Sea and deserves its place right in the centre of every map of the British Isles. Join me next time on this beautiful island to be introduced to some of its people and to take a trip down memory lane to the days of my youth. That's right, I'll be taking you to a time when Anglesey was awash with flared trousers, massive winged collars and permed hair as we take a nostalgic look at the year 2005. <laughs> so, until then, from me, Tidero, and it's goodbye for now, or as we would say in Welsh, who will vower am a tro, her blau am bloody Colin, get him in the gravy. <laughs> Where on earth is Anglesey? With a V, Tudor Owen, Lisa Jane Brown, and Gareth Pierce. With a Squenny Genny, with a David Ochenegol, and Gareth Gwyn, a Cynhyrchid, and Richard Morris. Cynhyrchid, and BBC Studios. There we go then, the end of the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week, obviously. But if you want more of me, subscribe to Newsjack on BBC Sounds. Hi, I'm Monty. Sorry for interrupting your podcast. Just give me a minute. I've got something I think you'll really love. It's called Life Lessons. This is a podcast from BBC Radio 4. It's going to be full of the issues that are important now. And we'll hear about them from people who really know what they're talking about. Because these issues are at the centre of their lives. We'll be hearing about period poverty from campaigner Amica George. Questioning the food we eat from farmer Kate Moore the Brexit divide from vlogger Jazza John and many, many more. Young UK talk about the issues that matter most to them. They're living it so we can learn from it. Subscribe to the Life Lessons podcast. Discover it now in BBC Sounds.